Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, tonight on the fascinating country that is India. My name's Johnny Bealby. I founded Wild Frontiers, and can I just say how delighted I am to be able to host a webinar about a country that is so close to my heart. Indeed, it was on a journey through the Indian subcontinent and into Afghanistan back in 1996 that Wild Frontiers was conceived. Um, and it is obviously a fascinating place because we have so many of you online tonight. I know there are over 700 people signed up for tonight's webinar, which just shows the level of interest in this magical country. Um, and I know we've got people from all over the world. So welcome to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You're most welcome and thank you very much for joining us. So let me just tell you a little bit about how this evening is going to pan out. Firstly, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on my own story with India. Um, and then I will talk about the two most visited regions of India, which is Rajasthan and Kerala. I'm then delighted to say that we will be joined by my great friend, uh, the broadcaster, author and travel writer, Kate Humble, to discuss a trip that she and her husband did through Wild Frontiers, uh, into Madhya Pradesh, a slightly more offbeat route that I hope uh, that many of you that will have been to India before will find uh, particularly interesting. After that, our Director of Product and Operations, Mark Liederman, who many of you will know, uh, will give us a, a bit of a spiel about one of his favourite parts of the country, which is a journey up to the Himalayas and Ladakh. Um, and after that, um, we'll take some questions and answers. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom there just to ask your questions. One thing I should say, of course, is that India is a vast country and travel there, travel options there are endless. One can, you know, I mean, I don't know how many times I've been and, and you can go time and time again. So obviously tonight we're really only scratching the surface. And if we don't talk about a region that you would like us to talk about, then do get in touch and we'd be very happy to discuss uh, other parts of the country with you as well. Um, of course, we are recording tonight's event, so we'll send out a link to the webinar tomorrow in an email, um, and then you can watch it again or send it to friends. Um, and we'll also answer some of the questions if we don't get around to answering them tonight. Hopefully the webinar should take about uh, an hour, although I do tend to waffle sometimes. So it might take a bit longer, but we will crack on through. Uh, so without further ado, let me share my screen and then we will uh, be back uh, where we were. Hang on just a second. It's that one, isn't it? Boom, boom, boom. And there we go. So yes, I'm Johnny Bealby, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, back in the 90s, I had three big adventures. I drove a motorbike around Africa. I walked through parts of India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I rode a horse 3,000 miles along the Silk Road from Kashgar to the Caspian Sea. This gave rise to my three travel books, Running with the Moon, about the motorcycle journey for a pagan song about the walk through India, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and Silk Dreams Troubled Road about the horse riding trip through Central Asia. Um, but India has always been really my kind of um, where my heart and soul lies. Um, people always ask me as the boss of Wild Frontiers, what's your favorite country? And I always say that's an impossible question to answer because everywhere is interesting. Everywhere has something. But how I answer it is I say the one country that I couldn't live without is India. Um, it's kind of in my blood. My mother was born there. This is a picture of my grandfather and grandmother, my mother and my uncle Martin. Um, they were born there just before uh, the end of the Raj. 
or the, just before the Second World War. Um, they lived in Bangalore uh, before moving to Cochin and then had a pretty um, hair-raising journey back um, during the Second World War. Um, but the story is this was the great adventure for my grandmother, certainly. My mum doesn't remember that much about it, but my grandmother certainly did, and she used to love telling us stories. So when we were kids not much older than the age you can see my mum there, we used to hear these stories of India and, and we used to love them. And it kind of got into me as, as a place that I wanted to go to. And as soon as I could, I started traveling there. Uh, first trip I did there was in 1989. Um, of course, sorry, I think we jumped one there. It is a vast country, as I say. It's roughly speaking 3,000 kilometers north, north to south and east to west. It's got a population of 1.38 billion. Um, it's the birthplace of three of the great religions of the world, uh, Buddhism, Sikhism, and of course, Hinduism. Um, 26 distinct languages. Uh, and Hindi, the dialect changes every 15 kilometers as you travel east to west or indeed west to east. Um, of course, with a size of a country like that, three million square kilometers, it's going to have some pretty varied landscapes. And it certainly does. Up in the north, you have the Himalayan region where you have stunning places like Ladakh, which Mark will be talking about later. And then all the way down south, you have the hot steaming kind of jungles of Kerala. In the northwest, northeast, sorry, you have the tea plantations of Assam, and in the northwest, you have the deserts of Rajasthan. And this is really the wonder of Rajasthan, that it has, sorry, of India, that it has something for every mood. You can go back there time and time and time again. And of course, the people of India are incredible, are as diverse as their landscapes. These are the Naga people from right up in the far northeast, bordering Myanmar, the Rajasthanis. This is an old Kashmiri shepherd I happened upon doing a journey from Ladakh to Kashmir. So it's really a country that offers so much. And that's, you know, as I say, we're only going to scratch the surface today. But um, that's why I love going back time and time again. I know what everyone wants to know. Uh, usual, we go through it on these uh, webinars is the COVID situation at the moment. So we'll just quickly talk about that. Um, there were 238,000 cases reported yesterday, um, there is, which is about half where it was back in May. There's a partial lockdown in Delhi and Mumbai. Uh, Omicron uh, is expected to peak around the end of January. Um, the other thing, though, that is quite extraordinary, really, is the world's biggest vaccine program, 1.6 billion injections given so far. Now, when you think that Britain is pretty proud of itself for having delivered 132 million and America has delivered 500 million, to have delivered 1.6 billion is pretty extraordinary. 66 million people, or roughly 50% of the population, are double vaccinated and booster jabs are already being rolled out. So where does that leave the traveller? Well, just um, just after Christmas, um, a seven day quarantine was put in place for everyone. It was in place for Europeans before Christmas. And we managed to send some American clients there over Christmas and they had an amazing time. Um, but after Christmas, with the rise of Omicron, that is now put in place for all travelers, which means that travel at the moment there from a tourist perspective is really not viable. Tourist visas are available. I've just got one and I will be traveling out there just as soon as that quarantine gets lifted. But we're advising people not to look to travel to India until the summer. And that will be the main summer routes of the Himalayan regions, which Mark will be talking about. Uh, and then for the more usual places like Rajasthan, Kerala, et cetera, it will be from October onwards. Uh, we have an office in Delhi. Uh, Pre-COVID, India was by far our biggest destination. About 25% of all our clients travel to India every year. We have our own office there, which gives us a great deal of flexibility to be able to do what we want to do and how we want to do it. So let's talk about Rajasthan, or at least beyond the Taj Mahal. Um, the Taj Mahal is, of course, one of the outstanding monuments of the world. It's in the new Seven Wonders of the World. Um, and it's, of course, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I had traveled to India a lot before I went to the Taj Mahal for the first time. In fact, the first time I went, I was taking a Wild Frontiers tour group. And as a travel writer, I'd been knocking around subcontinent for a long time and had never been. When I did go, I was blown away by it. It is simply one of the most, if not the most, incredible building ever built. It was built, obviously, as a monument to love by Shah Jahan for his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. 
back in 1632. It took 20 years to construct at a cost of today's pricing of 1 billion US dollars. So it wasn't cheap, but it is amazing. And it's considered the finest piece of Mughal architecture uh, in the world. Um, and so anybody that hasn't been to India, I think you should go to see the Taj Mahal. Now at this stage, I'm just gonna quickly do a poll. So if all of you are ready, I want to do a poll to see how many of you have been to India, how many of you have been to India more than once, twice, three times, so we can just gauge the kind of, you know, our audience tonight. So I'm just gonna launch this poll if I can. Whoops. Come here. Right, so there you go. Uh, oh no, hang on, I've got to launch it. There we are. So if you could answer that, I'll give you a little bit of time, um, uh, maybe 30 seconds or so. This is great, 200 of you, Ooh, they're getting there. This is really interesting, goodness. Okay, I'm going to end the poll in five seconds. Right, let's end that poll. Okay, share results, let's have a look. Um, so that's really interesting. Only 18% have never been to India. 20% uh, have visited once, 18% have visited twice, and 44% have visited three times or more. So goodness, uh, well, I suppose at Wild Frontiers, I would have maybe shouldn't be surprised by that. Um, you're all avid travelers, I know, and India, of course, is a great um, is a great destination. So that's very interesting. So um, let's crack on then and talk about a place that certainly some of you will have been to, which is Rajasthan. So R Rajasthan is um, the land of kings. Uh, arguably, oops, sorry. Let's just get rid of that again. Beg your pardon. Um, the most uh, colourful state in India. It's the biggest state in India, seventh biggest by population. And of course, it has many extraordinary sights to be seen, like incredible monuments. Um, it's got the desert, it's got museums, great cities, etc. And any journey through Rajasthan is probably going to take you through some of these towns. Um, Jaipur, or where you have, which is top right, where, sorry, top left, where you have the famous Palace of the Winds. Um, you have the, uh, the, the observatory, the city palace, and just outside town, you have the Amber Palace, which was the image I showed you before. Uh, going to Jodhpur next, um, the Blue City. This is, has the incredible Mahirgarh Fort uh, on the hill above it, which is one of the most spectacular forts in all India. Um, great thing to do there, go and have a champagne. Um, uh, reception with the curator of the magazine, of the magazine, of the museum, sorry. Um, that's a wonderful thing to do there. Udaipur, of course, the Venice of the East, probably one of the most romantic cities on earth, one of my favourite towns. Um, absolutely beautiful with sitting on the lake there um, and the old town all around where you can just go wandering and sit on rooftop restaurants and enjoy yourself and there's also lots of sights to be seen there and then you know at Wild Frontiers we love to get off the beaten track and there are plenty of places in Rajasthan that most people don't go to and Bundi is one of them. Bundi is one of our favorite towns it's like got stepping back in time there are very few tourists there are very few hotels only a couple of really lovely boutique hotels one of which is owned and run by the manager of the Wild Frontiers office in Delhi. Um, the palace is spectacular and it just takes you back. It's more like how Udaipur would have been 30 odd years ago. Um, and of course, there are other towns. Uh, don't get me wrong. There's Jaisalmer, there's Bikaneer, there's Nagur. There's plenty of other places uh, to see. There are amazing palace hotels. That The beauty of Rajasthan is that in the richness of the culture of the Mughal and, and the, the Rajput culture. And that has given rise to these fantastic palaces that can now be stayed in as hotels. So, the most famous is the Lake Palace, which is the second most photographed building in India, after obviously the Taj Mahal. You have the Samod Palace just outside Jaipur, Devi Gard just outside Udaipur, and Benstragar, one of the many really truly rural off the beaten track palace hotels. Of course, there's fabulous wildlife. Ranthambore um, Wildlife Park it, is probably one of the best places to see tigers in India. It's also incredibly conveniently located and you will see others of these animals there as well, like the Langa monkey. 
uh, markets, temples, museums, experiences, all can be had here. Um, the bottom right you can see is a picture of our product manager, Anna, who is having her photograph taken on what is purported to be the oldest camera in India, 150 years old. And the result was that, which kind of looks about 150 years old, not Anna, I should add. Um, so there's masses to do there. It's, it's an incredibly um, beautiful state. And certainly if you haven't been to India before, it is a great place to start your India experiences, your India adventure. You fly into Delhi. This is, uh, we offer both group tours and private uh, tailor-made trips. This is our uh, signature group tour, which is our most popular group tour. Uh, and it does pretty much everything I've just explained there. It takes you down to Agra. It goes into Ranthambore Park. Uh, it takes you off the beaten track to some of the more rural palace hotels, as well as Jaipur, Jodhpur, Udaipur, um, and is very popular trip. But if you like to do things on your own, you want to have things tailor made, then of course we will design a trip specially for you. Um, that leads me on to Kerala, which is the second most popular place. A third of all visitors to India travel to Rajasthan. Probably not much less than that travel to Kerala as well. The way I look at Kerala is that it's a little bit more of a holiday destination than, the, than Rajasthan. Rajasthan is a travel destination. You know, you go from place to place, you're in the hubbub, the towns are quite frenetic, um, you know, going to see the monuments and stuff. Um, of course, you can get away from that, but it's, it's, it's quite, um, yeah, it's, it's quite busy. Whereas going down south, you're heading into the, um, the, 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 the much quieter, calmer, more laid back south. Uh, and there's no, nothing uh, more um, laid back to do in the south than the backwaters. Um, these are 900 kilometers of canals, lagoons, lakes, all fed by the rivers that flow off the Western Ghats. Um, they run along the Malabar coast, which, which, which is uh, on the Arabian Sea. Um, and it's a fascinating place to, to just sit on one of these houseboats. There are some fabulous ones, the Lotus boat you can see here, top left, uh, where you can really have quite a luxurious experience. They have bicycles on board, so you can get off and go and bicycle through villages and things like that. And you can see life, life takes place on these backwaters. Um, and uh, you can just enjoy quite a nice relaxing time. Of course, you can relax even more on some of the beaches. You have the Kovalam Beach, you have, um, you have uh, um, uh, oh goodness, um, uh, Varkala, uh, and my own personal favourite, which is further up north, which is called Nileshwa. Um, these are, are, are great places to chill out, um, but I would just put a little bit of a uh, caution in here. Um, the bottom right picture is not Kerala, that is actually the Andaman Islands. And if your idea of kind of tropical beaches is like that with a blue sea and a white beach, you will get that in the Andaman Islands. You don't get it so much on the west coast of India. The west coast of India, it's quite rough. Um, the walking along the beaches is fabulous. It's absolutely beautiful, but the sea is quite rough and churning and, and, and got quite a heavy uh, undercurrent. So you need to be careful. So if it's kind of a real fly and flop beach holiday you want, then possibly the Maldives or, or the Andaman Islands might be better. But as a part of a bigger journey around Kerala, the beaches are fantastic. Great places to stay, really high quality hotels, Nileshwa Hermitage, um, the Old Harbour in Cochin, um, the Coconut Lagoon on one of the, on, on the backwaters there as well, and plenty more. And the cultural highlights, um, the, uh, you could take a train up to Uti to go and see the, um, the, the or, or Munar to see the, the, the um, tea plantations. You can see in Cochin, there's fabulous heritage walks to do, the old Chinese fishing nets, um, and the Katakali dancing, which is a very famous part of the Kerala culture. Wildlife again, some fabulous national parks, the Paria National Park, and if you just step a little bit across the border into Karnataka, you get the Nagahole National Park. Plenty of beautiful animals um, and birds. Uh, I became a bit of a twitcher. I wrote one of my books sitting um, on a beach hut in, in uh, Goa, and the bird life was extraordinary. And somebody lent me a pair of binoculars, and I became quite an avid Indian twitcher. They're just beautiful, beautiful tropical birds. And of course, there's wellness. You can you can do, indulge yourself in, in all of that. And after the time we've been having with COVID, why not um, enjoy some yoga or some spa treatments? 
And the cuisine, the cuisine of India uh, generally is, is, well, I'm sure you all know what the cuisine is like. The South is generally a little bit more spicy, um, is more vegetarian based, but they do have fantastic seafood down there as well. You can see the talis, idlis, dosas, all that sort of thing. And the, uh, and the, um, uh, the uh, talis, which you get also in the North, but the North you'll get more meat dishes, typical Rogan Josh and stuff like that. So, those are the two. This is the most popular Kerala trip we do. It's called Inside Kerala and Karnataka. You fly into Bangalore, travel down through um, Karnataka, which takes in Mysore, which is a wonderful town as well, before traveling down the Malabar coast, doing some time on the backwaters, Cochin, um, and up into the hills as well. So those are the two areas that 18% of you those of you that haven't been, or indeed the other 18% that have been once, might be interested to go and discover. However, for those of you that have been a few times, um, I think you're going to be more interested in what we're going to talk about now, which is joining uh, my good friend, Kate Humble. Uh, good evening, Kate. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, I'm sorry I utterly failed. I was going to have a lovely Indian background uh, like you have, um, but uh, technology failed me. So I'm sorry, you've just got my slightly scrappy notice board. <laughs> um, hey, it's important it's lovely we want you, here. Not, Hello, not, not your background. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kate, that is, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're a busy, busy person at the moment, um, so we're much appreciated. Um, I thought what I'd do is to start off is just by asking you, you know, wh wh when did you first go to India? Why and where? And um, what, what, what did you love about the country? Well, I had a slightly sort of bizarre first trip to India. It was a working trip. I had, um, so my background for, for anyone who doesn't know is that um, I am a broadcaster, I'm on, I'm on TV, but I'm also a, a travel journalist. And um, I got my first job at the BBC um, because of being a travel journalist. And I worked on the holiday programme. And um, I was and it was on the holiday programme that I was actually asked to uh, to present films. And um, so I'd never presented before. I'd worked, you know, behind the scenes in telly, uh, but um, I was I was given this sort of astonishing opportunity, really, to to be a, a, a presenter. And um, I think possibly only because of my surname, <laughs> I was given I was given a a, a kind of um, a little slot of my own on the program called humble holidays and um they were all holidays under 100 quid which was obviously why i never spoke to you then johnny <laughs> that's not not your speciality um but there was at the time there was um this this sort of it, it was a bit of a fashion really for doing kind of charity challenges yeah. um in in kind of fun and exotic places and so we did a story about that and the challenge that i did was to cycle <laughs> across the Himalayas for charity <laughs> I know I know from where to I where I don't think I don't think I'd been in, on a bike for you know 30 years or something so we flew into Delhi and then went up to Simla this would have been sort of mid 90s probably yeah. and uh, you know, there was, I don't know, there was probably 200 of us in um, in, in slightly ill thought through Lycra, um, uh, you know, puffing our way up these terrifying slopes um, with, with these amazing, and the thing I remember, partly because it was terrifying and partly because they were just sort of, uh, just wonderfully, to me, they just encapsulated the energy and the colour and the madness of the country with the buses um, that would come screaming around these you know terrifying bends with all their kind of lights and 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 and, and kind of pom-poms and decorations and people hanging out of windows and off the roof and and I was just I don't know I just it there was something about it, it was that kind of energy and that it's almost um there's a there's a there's a, a joy when you see a bunch of kids kind of playing they have a they have a kind of unselfconscious joy and energy about them and that to me is 
what encapsulates everything about India. It still has that sort of childlike enthusiasm for everything. It's yeah. kind of embedded in the in the in in the fabric of the country. And so that first trip. Um, kind of bewitched me even though I came back with the sorest bottom I have ever had <laughs> and thighs burning thighs oh. yeah god well I, I mean so so yeah I can imagine that I mean also you're kind of probably cycling at some quite high altitudes so yeah um, yeah you know, no, the whole not... thing the whole thing was probably a very bad idea and I think I I think I managed to you know raise about I don't know 120 quid or something <laughs> well back in 1995 yeah. <laughs> yeah. um so Kate We've known each other quite a long time, and um, you, you you came to me and said, um, L Ludo and I, Ludo being your husband, obviously, Ludo and I want to go on holiday to India. Well, I've been yes. to India a couple of times as as a as a, as a, a journalist and a, a TV presenter, etc. But I want to go on a holiday. Yeah. Now, yeah. I'm kind of thinking, okay, that's great, lovely, Kate. I can't wait to kind of help you put this together. There's another part of me that's going. I know Kate is probably the best travel person I've ever met in my life. And she wants me to put together a really special trip off the beaten track for her and Ludo. So there was a degree of kind of, I wouldn't say panic, but there was a degree of kind of, okay, we kind of got to get this right. Um, do you want to explain what your brief was to me? Yeah, I mean, it was, it, it, yes. I mean, you're making me sound very deaverish. Um, but um, uh, yes, I mean, my brief was that, you know, I'd, I'd been to various parts of India uh, for work. I'd probably been five or six times. But again, you know, uh, anyone out there who's been anywhere for work, even though it feels like everyone's really jealous that you're going off, actually, you know, it is work and yes you might see things but you never get that feeling of, of proper immersion that you do when you're you know you're having a holiday. Ludo had only been to Mumbai and again that was for work as well so and he was particularly uh, he felt he'd really missed out by not having uh, any time in India at all um, and so my brief to you was is there a, a region or a place in India where we can feel like we're getting a really authentic sense of the country? We don't really want to see lots of other foreigners. We want to, you know, we want to be an in Ind Indian India. And, you know, as you said in your introduction, it is, it is a country with an embarrassment of riches. And, and I feel this, actually, I feel this about almost every country. You know, the problem is that countries almost suffer from having their jewels, having their, their Taj Mahals and the equivalent. And they become these sort of honeypots that everybody goes to. Um, and, and actually that means that, you know, the burden often falls on very small areas of, of a country, um, but equally the benefits only go to small areas. And it's something as a, as a travel journalist, as an environmentalist, as, as someone who, who feels very strongly that I want travel to be a positive thing for the places that I go, um, is something that I always want to try and avoid, which was why I said to you, you know, guide us, take us somewhere where people don't go. Um, but I am still, you know, and this was the deaverish bit, I want somewhere where no one goes, but I still wanted to be magnificent. Um, <laughs> you know, I still want really great photos. I want great food. I want wildlife. I want architecture. I want, you know, history. Um, I want it all, Johnny. And, a little, um, I and nobody a there. And a little bit of luxury thrown in as well. And a little bit, yeah, just every now and then I quite like a shower. <laughs> Very good. So I said to Kate, I know exactly where, where, where you should go. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen again because I've kind of got your photos. So let me put those up and then we're down the side here and we can kind of chat through them. Yeah. So let's talk about how you started the journey. So yes, I mean, we we flew into Delhi, uh, a sensible place to fly into, and actually to have 24 hours in Delhi and just to kind of uh, get yourself in the sort of Indian frame of mind is something that I would recommend to everybody. I really, uh, I loved our, our 24 hours, um, just sort of, we did a bit of wandering around, uh, we we ate fabulous food, um, and, uh, and then we uh, packed up and got onto this train. 
and um and it was all you know you hear stories i remember you know when when everyone was doing their kind of gap years in india and these stories of 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 the madness at train stations and having to get tickets and that's the joy of <laughs> of doing things in a slightly more grown up way now is that it was all beautifully organized we had our tickets there was no mad scramble we didn't have to throw our rucksacks into the window and jump onto a moving train uh, we just you know in a very civilized way got onto a train with our tickets uh, to head to uh, the the city of Gwalior um, and uh, what was what what I loved uh, about this train journey was that um, there, there were quite a lot of uh, other tourists on the on the train um, but this is the train that also stops at the Taj Mahal and the entire train emptied and Ludo and I continued to sit there feeling slightly smug and adventurous uh, as the train then pulled away from the Taj Mahal and carried on for another hour or so to um, to Gwalior, where we were the only foreigners um, to alight onto the platform. Um, and I, I mean, I can't, I can't really understand why it hasn't become, you know, overrun because it is, it's magnificent. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 it's really interesting. That that train is called the Shatabdi Express, and I suspect lots of our viewers who have been to India before will have been on that train. It, it runs down to Gwalior and then on to Bhopal, and, and it, it takes in some wonderful places. But as you say, everyone gets off in Agra to see the Taj Mahal, and then, generally speaking, travels west into Rajasthan. So traveling down here, you're right, you're immediately kind of off the beaten track. And what splendor awaits you? I mean, the Gwalior Fort is quite definitely one of the most spectacular, if not the most spectacular fort uh, in India. It's absolutely. Yeah. And it, I mean, it is, it is, it is breathtaking. It's so beautiful. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's position perched as it is right on the top of that cliff uh, with, with the sort of city below it, um, the wonderful gate that elephants would have walked through. Um, I mean, it, and, and, but just the tile work, I don't think in all my time in India and, and, and you know, as I say, I've, I've been to some sort of odd places because of the nature of the type of filming that I've done. So I haven't, you know, I haven't seen some of the really magnificent buildings uh, of, of kind of Rajasthan, but I'd never seen a building like this. And and the the you know that the that color of the tiles that the the just the 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 warmth of that terracotta the the yeah. just it just the splendor and the scale of it and again the staggering thing was that we walked around I mean well you can see how empty that's one of my not yeah, that's your the picture. photos I'm sorry yeah. but there's you know there was hardly anybody there we just we just we could walk around for hours and hours and hours completely unmolested never feeling like we were kind of uh sort of that slightly panicky feeling when you feel like there's just too many people around um and and it the it, and it was just we went we went back several times actually we went at sort of different times of day and it was just as I say, it was it was a breathtaking start to our off the beaten track. Um, but but with this very much with this feeling of why is this? <laughs> why, why isn't anybody yeah. coming? And, and, and it's and, not it's not as if you need to uh, to, to to kind of stay in a, a pretty horrid place. No, like a very we nice stayed we stayed in an absolutely yeah. lovely hotel. Our guide yeah. was magnificent. I mean, there's lots of other places, lots of other things to see in Gwalior, but what I like about it is that it's quite bite-sized. So yeah. you can actually, you know, you, you, A, you can feel, even if you were a relatively inexperienced traveler, full stop and, and hadn't been to India very often or at all, you wouldn't feel nervous about jumping in a tuk-tuk and kind of going around. It's not huge. Uh, it feels kind of manageable. It's good entry level India in a way. Um, and it's incredibly friendly. I mean, I, I love street food um, and uh, well, I love food, but I, and I particularly love street food. Gwalior has wonderful markets. Um, we, had, um, we had a chai competition as, uh, as, as we went through 
through on our journey and drank chai in every little stall that we could find to find, you know, the best chai maker um, in, in Madhya Pradesh. Um, and it was, we had a wonderful, wonderful guide there who initially thought that we would want to see, you know, the Maharaja's palace and the Gwalior and uh, the, the fort and, you know, the kind of standard things. And we said, we sort of do, but actually, you know, one of the joys of being with you, you were born and bred here. What was it like growing up? We want to see the places. And he took us to the sweet shop where his grandparents used to take him when he'd done well in his exams. And there was, it was like something out of the middle ages with people still making this amazing kind of sesame seed paste, pounding sesame seeds on, on rocks in this tiny little little shop sort of at the at the back of the fort. It had it had this sort of wonderful atmosphere. And for the first time I think ever that I've been to India, I felt not obviously not like a local, but I felt more kind of embedded in 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 the the city and how it worked. You know, I could go and buy local food. I could go and um, just sort of walk around the streets and feel very comfortable um, and and constantly entranced. I have to say, this photograph, both these two photographs, are making me feel rather peckish. You eating your puri over here with your your street curry. Um, yeah, my bit, chili. There was a lot of chili. Just to give you a little bit of a plug here, Kate, um, for, oh, no, you for, our, be doing this. for our viewers, um, has spent all day today signing 3,000 copies of her new cookbook. So, I mean, I, I, Kate, I just throw through it in there. I mean, I'm not uh, expecting there to be too many Indian recipes in your new cookbook, but you're obviously a big foodie, and I'm lucky enough to have sat at your kitchen table and eaten your food, so I can say what a good cook you are. But um, any Indian influence in there at all? That's a, a little bit of Indian influence in there, quite a lot of chilli. Um, I mean, you can see, take the book away, people don't need to see that. Um, but, but in the photo behind, I am waving a green chilli. There's quite a lot of green chilli appears in, in uh, my cook in my cookbook but um yeah it was the 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 food was definitely um a great feature for me when we were there um and i think i think the great surprise was really where you sent us next which was bhopal let's jump on to bhopal there we are so yes absolutely so let's i mean you were a bit surprised when i decided to send you to a place that is really only known for one rather sad thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the death of over 30,000 people uh, as a result of a factory uh, exploding. Um, uh, and, and you, you know, that is what, if anyone's heard of Bhopal, that's why they've heard of it. Um, and of course, it's a tragedy that uh, affected pretty much everybody who lives in that city, not a single person uh, was left unscathed. They lost members of families or um, or relations or friends. Um, a, a really devastating event. However, um, uh, without wanting to sound insensitive, that is not a reason not to go. Perhaps it's a really good reason to go um, because what I experienced was a city with a really strong sense of identity, perhaps a, str a, a sense of community um, as a result of what had happened there. And so it had this really, as I say, this very um, strong sense of, of what it was. It was very proud of itself. Um, and it just had, it, it, this, this is the kids playing cricket in the square. Ludo obviously had to play cricket with them. Um, and, um, and, and it has a wonderful market. It has, there's a lot of faded sort of glamour in Bhopal, you know, the, the architecture the, these, is spectacular, yeah. These beautiful, beautiful buildings. And actually there's a huge restoration program going on there. So I suspect, um, you know, anyone going to Bhopal now will see um, the results of that. Um, but again, it was just, a, it was just an incredibly friendly city. People wanted to talk, people wanted to chat. There are these amazing lakes. You could walk around again, uh, you, you know, just feeling very much sort of, feeling safe um, and and it was it was a lovely place to walk you, uh, uh, there wasn't a sort of enormous amounts of, of of kind of traffic and and pollution it was just as I say it was a bustling city there was a lot of interest there it felt very local not remotely touristy but 
absolutely charming really the hotel that we stayed in was 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 wonderful um and uh, a proper kind of family run hotel very comfortable um uh, very sort of very stylish um and and a lovely base for um visiting a really you know a really surprisingly interesting and engaging city yeah it's a difficult one to kind of call to say to people, we think you should go to Bhopal. They do kind of look at you like you're slightly bonkers, but <laughs> absolutely worth it. Again, it's, it's as you just described, it's beautiful offbeat, but great markets, great architecture, and, and you know, very few other, other Western tourists there. Yeah. And from there, you get this really good routing that takes you, first of all, via Sanchi. Yeah, and um, I mean, you know, this absolutely remarkable, remarkable monument, um, and um, and 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 actually, this was my, one of several. Again, you had found in typical Wild Frontier style, I have to say, um, a really incredible guide, but a young guide who was absolutely um, passionate about his city. He'd been born in Bhopal, but also um, about all these places that are within very easy reach of it. Um, so, you know, this extraordinary Buddhist site, um, but then we went on to uh, that. I mean, it, it, the carvings just take your take your breath away. But then this place, you know, in, in, in sort of context contrast, Bin Bector, um, a, a beautiful countryside. You start sort of coming away from the, the more urban areas, getting into this really alluring kind of uh, more rural landscapes and uh, the sort of trees and, and rocky outcrops. And in amongst these rocky outcrops are these staggering, staggering cave paintings, uh, you know, this, this, this encapsulation of, uh, a, a, of, a, of a time gone by that, you know, that is so illustrative of, of, of what people were doing then. And again, it's super accessible. Uh, you don't have to do any sort of massive climbing or massive walking to, to see these remarkable cave paintings. Um, and you particularly like this one that we brought back, didn't you, Johnny, the drummers I, I, and the dancers? I, I do, and there's, there's a reason for it. I'll, I'll just quickly tell, I mean, some of this, they think Ben Becker has been in, inhabited for over 100,000 years. It, it, some of the rock art they think is some of the oldest in the world, dating back to Paleolithic times, 35,000 years old. This particular picture I absolutely love. It, it's, it's from the somewhere between Neolithic and, 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 um, and Paleolithic. So they think that's around about seven, 8,000 years old. What I love about it is that it is exactly the same routine here. You can see the drummer at the top beating the drum and the people dancing. And where I take people up into the far reaches of the Hindu Kush to visit the Kalash tribes, um, if my computer moves on the screen, you will, oops, hang on a minute, there you go. You will see that this exact dance takes place at all the festivals that go on up there in the pagan valleys. So you can see here the drummer beating the drum with his two hands, the drum round his neck, and the women all linking arms, dancing in a, in a kind of, um, in, 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 in that sort of fashion. So you've got a picture here from seven, eight, nine thousand years old, scraped onto a wall, and people still doing it. You know, yeah. ten thousand years later, it's quite remarkable. It, it's a place that's easily kind of missed, I suppose. But but you know, on on the trip Kate's talking about, so far we've already gone past three UNESCO World Heritage sites, and that's yeah. not including the Taj Mahal. So you know, the, the, there are amazing things coming out through this off the beaten track part of India. But from there we wanted, you know, this is where your brief also was a bit of adventure, a bit of walking, a bit of, um, you know, getting into to, to wildlife. And this is what we did from here. Yeah. So um, you told me uh, you had just been, I think, to yeah. the Ranipani Jungle Lodge, um, which was run by the same family that ran the place that we stayed in Bhopal. And um, and it is beautiful. It might be useful uh, for um, for listeners to know that we went in the winter. Um, so we were there in. Was it sort of? Oh gosh, I can't remember. I think you was were there it? February, were you? I think it was. I think it was yeah. a, around about this time of year, or a little little bit later. But we were there in the winter, and. Um, 
Uh, and I have, despite my profession, um, never seen a tiger in the wild. I've seen lots of footprints. I've seen scratches on trees. Um, I've slept in a tree house and apparently a tiger walked around the bottom of it while I was asleep in it, but um, I've never actually seen one. So I did slightly hope that we might see a tiger. Um, and um, I had not done a, a, a safari in India before if you can call an Indian safari a safari because it's such an African word. But anyway, I'd not been to an Indian national park before. Um, and uh, one of the things that really, really impressed me was, again, the guides, um, Ali, who runs the Rani Penny uh, Jungle Lodge, um, and his guy, I mean, he's, he's the son of the kind of owner of the hotel. And I have to say, in a slightly dismissive way, I thought, oh, they're just, you know, giving their kids jobs. Um, Ali is one of the best naturalists I think I've ever, ever met and been in the field with, and all his guides are the same. So we had a really interesting time uh, in the national park. Almost saw a tiger, just missed it, apparently. But we did <laughs> see, you know, we did see some wonderful stuff. The bird life, I mean, you were talking about bird yeah. life. The bird life just in the camp itself was just, magnificent and yeah you know bears um uh i mean just it just fantastic fantastic wildlife but the real treat about this region and this national park was the thing that you told me johnny was that it was the only national park that you can actually walk in and that ali had been developing a walking route through it um, and, uh, and and as you can see from that photo the terrain is is fairly dramatic um, but the route that he had developed was very cleverly started at the top and worked its way down so it was a very comfortable uh, very pleasant walking route um, that took us through you know took us from uh, the changing vegetation from high up uh, on the on the sort of the, the the there's a sort of hill station up there and I can't remember its name Johnny Pach, Pachmari 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 thank you so yes there's a little little hill station up there that almost feels like a little village in Surrey um, and then you uh, and you start there and make your way down and for three days we walked we literally didn't see another soul we did see tracks of tiger we did see you know signs of bear uh, we saw magnificent birds we saw beautiful butterflies it was just a really wonderful way of experiencing this landscape I mean I'm a great proponent of doing everything on foot and you know this was a real real treat um, and of course the greatest treat of all was that you would walk all day and you know that sounds like hard work it absolutely wasn't this was very slow walking there was plenty of time to just sit and look and admire wildlife to to just stand and smell the air and um and and talk about the vegetation and how things changed and and, and what lived where there was you know this wasn't a march at all this was a very gentle walk um swimming in the rivers it was absolutely wonderful and then at the end of the day the end of our first day we came down to the river and uh, and we had to walk across the river to find a fully stocked bar and um the most luxurious of tents it was it was just it was that it, it just felt like only in india would this happen that we would have this just beautiful walk and, and feeling so remote and you know not seeing a soul and then turn up and somebody saying madam can i get you a gin and tonic and you, you're like oh you were our guinea country. pigs here kate unfortunately when i was last in sapporo with ali um they hadn't got this particular um operation organized but i knew as soon as they did that it was you know those guys do things really well oh my god uh, and 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 you you went and guinea pigged it for us it was it, well i i have to say i've never Ever been a happier guinea pig and, <laughs> and and as you can see you know it was actually it was quite cold um at night and um it was beautiful walking temperature during the day but at night it was quite cold and we would sit with a with a wonderful fire we had three course dinner um and then we would you know melt away to our tents where hot water bottles were waiting yeah. in the beds i mean it was just it was it was just 
utterly splendid luxury, <laughs> completely glorious. Um, and, and what campsites? And we moved, what was, what was really special was moving every day. So we would have our breakfast and, and wander off, you know, with binoculars clamped to the front of our faces to see yet more fabulous wildlife. And, and, and all this lot would be packed up, melted away. There would be no sign that we had been there at all. And then at the end of the next day, in yet another incredibly beautiful location, uh, the bar would be set, the fire would be lit, and uh, and dinner would be served. Okay, um, fantastic. Uh, just kind of closing off, what are your kind of final thoughts of of the trip? And and um, I, I suppose I, I mean I'm kind of assuming it delivered on the brief. Um, any any kind of final thoughts? I mean, it really, it, 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 what it, what it did. Yes, it totally delivered on the brief. I think, I think actually, it ex exceeded our expectations because, um, what not wanting to do you any sort of disservice, but you slightly think that if you book a trip through a travel company, it's never really, really going to be off the beaten track. Um, and and as you know, Johnny, I have I've always been a sort of an independent traveller. Um, you know, I never book holidays through through tour operators, and and this was actually. I think probably the first time I ever had. And what it showed me was that actually, you know, working with somebody, you know, with people and your people on the ground who really know a country um, means that you actually do get to see things that as an independent traveller, we wouldn't have found and we wouldn't have seen, particularly in a country as vast as India. Um, but it also proved that even though, you know, it has been bewitching uh, foreign visitors for centuries, there are still many, many, many places, um, many possibilities for anybody to go back. I mean, you know, your poll said that many of the people watching this have been more than three times. You could go every year for your whole lifetime and still yeah. be off the beaten track and still see something that you've never seen before. You so could. I mean, your, your point about how the honey trap of certain routes and certain places it is so true of, of, in, of, of Rajasthan particularly, when you do the routings, I mean, and, and for good reason, there are some fantastic things to be seen, but literally go five kilometers off that and you'll find yeah. something, you know, I don't say equally magnificent, but something magnificent that nobody goes to. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a country that is, 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 is there for a lifetime of um, exploration. And I think, I think, you know, my, I suppose what I would say is, is, um, be be brave let let you know let you and your team's imaginations run one run wild um uh because um as i say that i saw parts of india that i would never have found on my own and never would have gone to hey thank you so much um i hope you're going to stay with us so we get some questions at the end absolutely um, here comes mark now mark will say don't forget about me um, which we kind of almost have again. But Mark, please take your time. We're all all ears to hear about Ladakh in the north. Thank you very much. I knew I should never have gone after Johnny and Kate, but there you go. <laughs> anyway, hello, everyone. Um, I won't rush, but I will. I've got a fairly brief thing just to talk you through one of my favourite parts of India. And it starts at the Taj Mahal, because yes, 20 years ago was when I first went to India, just over 20 years ago. And the Taj Mahal was pretty much where I started. I went around Rajasthan, I saw, ti I did see tigers, Kate, um, and it is phenomenal. But I've been to India several times, and I think it was on my third or fourth trip that I did a trip which went pretty much due north of Delhi. Um, and it went right over four Himalayan mountain passes to the Buddhist town of Leh, which sits at three and a half thousand meters high upon the Tibetan plateau. And it really is considered one of the world's most incredible journeys. And it's one that we take on our Journey to Ladakh group tour. And as you can see, Kate said that she went in February and the main season for going to Rajasthan and really most of India is kind of October to March time. But in the summer, that's when you can access the higher areas. You've got the, um, well, 
Um, rest of India is in 40 degree monsoon heat. You've got Shimla and Dharamsala and Manali, which are cool hill stations. And beyond that, you've got the rain shadow of the high Himalaya. So this is really the region. And this is really where we think we'll open up first for India tourism this year. So just to talk you through that routing, it does start as many trips do in Delhi. And I think Delhi is a really underrated city. It's got this eclectic mix of old and new. And if you're not in love with Delhi, then I would definitely recommend you to read William Dalrymple's City of Gins. It's a few years old, but it is fantastic. And it will give you a, a love of the city, which may not immediately be apparent. But from Delhi, we take a train to Kalka. And from there, we change to a what they call a toy train, the Himalayan Queen, which takes you up from the plains up to the hill station of Shimla. Now this railway has got 800 bridges over 100 tunnels and it was built by the British in between 1898 and 1903. And it takes you to Shimla, which was where the entire Indian or the British Raj relocated in the summer to escape the heat. So you will find bizarre kind of very English, very British kind of vestiges there. But interestingly, it's not a dead town by any means. Um, a lot of Indians today go up there for their summer holidays to escape the heats of the plains. So it's a really, really interesting mix. And I think that's where Kate said that she cycled to. The train is definitely um, less painful on bottoms. From there, we take a journey through the foothills to Dharamsala, um, the twin town of Macleod Ganj Dharamsala, which is the home of the Dalai Lama um, and the home of the Tibetan um, government in exile. And this is a really good introduction to Tibetan Buddhism, a chance to meet monks. We have had people that have had audiences with the Dalai Lama himself. And as you go through places like the Tibetan children's village, um, it's a really good place to learn more about really some of the, the dangerous and perilous journeys that a lot of the Tibetans have taken in order to flee from Tibet and to come over the border to India and to make homes for themselves in Dharamsala. It's also a good place to buy warm and very colourful clothing for journeys to the high mountains, which are coming up. But before we get there, we've got more journeys through beautiful, beautiful Himalayan foothills, through places like Palampur, which is tea country, places like Bajnath, where there's a 900 year old Shiva temple, till eventually you get to Manali, which has got a real alpine feel to it. Um, we've got uh, walks that take us through the old town and through some of the neighbouring villages where they've got this beautiful, if crumbling, kind of wooden architecture. And this is where everything really starts to change because Manali is the start or the end of the late Manali Highway. And it really is a spectacular drive. It takes about three days and your first major encounter with it is leaving Manali and going up over the Rotang Pass at 3,980 metres. It's an incredible journey to get up to the top and a lot of people do just day trip from Manali, go up to the pass and then come down again. But we continue up over into the rain shadow of the Himalaya and as you can see almost immediately the scenery changes dramatically. Um, and it is really one of the most amazing routes that I've done. If you've been to Pakistan and you've done the Karakoram Highway, I would say they're almost like sisters. They've got different things to offer, but it is a breathtaking journey. And throughout, you have these very amusing and slightly eccentric um, Indian government road safety signs, which I think a lot of people kind of find amusing. And my favourite, albeit very sexist one, is this one. Don't gossip, let him drive. Moving on um, through more spectacular scenery, the highest place where we spend the night is a place called Sachu at 4,100 metres. And then from there, you go up over the Taglang La Pass. Now, this is the second highest motorable pass in the world. It sits at 5,400 metres. Um, and it really is quite a spectacular um, feat of engineering to have built it and obviously is a journey to go over it. We come down the other side and take the journey down to Leh. Now Leh is the Ladakhi capital and it sits on an important, what was a very important trading crossroads going from India in the south right the way up to China in the north and going from Tibet over in the east right the way through to Kashmir over in the west. 
And one of the iconic sites in town is the Ley Palace, which you can see here on the right, dating from the early 17th century. Um, it's nine stories high and it actually predates um, its um, sister, the Patala Palace in Lhasa, although obviously the Patala Palace in Lhasa is much, much bigger, but it's an incredible site and it sits overlooking the old town of Leh, which is definitely worth a wander through, but it is worth noting that it's considered one of the most um, endangered sites in the um, world, partly um, because of climate change and the mud brick buildings there. And the whole region of Leh and Ladakh it's just different. It's breathtaking. The architecture of the houses there is very different. It gets very cold in winter. So you can see there the thick insulation that a lot of the houses have on top. They have very thick walls. And because land is not of a, of a premium here, even quite poor families have got huge houses that, you know, if they were in commutable distances of London or New York would cost absolute millions. But they're breathtakingly beautiful. And the people here, as you can see in their facial features, share much more in common with their neighbours over in Tibet and Bhutan than they do down with their um, kind of fellow Indians down on the plains. And Buddhism here is very much the, the main religion. Pretty much 50% of people um, consider themselves to be Buddhist. You'll find prayer wills, you'll find statues everywhere. Um, and it's very much a part of Leh and Ladakhi life, as are the, um, the monasteries, which you'll find scattered right the way throughout Leh and its suburbs. Again, breathtakingly beautiful, often built in high land, um, fortified. And if anyone's been to Bhutan, they serve similar functions that they're also kind of administrative centers. And they are also um, the centers for um, monks to go and um, and train and we often get access to kitchens meet novices and if you're lucky and if you choose the right timing you can coincide with one of the amazing festivals that they have there really great colorful places to, to mingle with locals to see the colors to see the beautiful dancing to see the masks um, and they usually last for a couple of days and it's also a great place to do some shopping. Again, being a trading centre, you'll find goods coming in from all over, but there are some really nice local goods as well. And that's really the almost the end of the trip. Um, and often, you know, the kind of, you know, coming back to the capital city at the end of the trip can be a little bit of a downer, but not on this trip. Your flight from Leh to Delhi is a spectacular flight over the high Himalaya um, and can form a, a really nice ending to that trip. So that's a really nice kind of two week routing. But if you have more time, um, Leh is not the end of the road and you can do more. And some of you may know Shalmali, who is our Indian subcontinent travel specialist. And she would be on the webinar tonight, but it is um, midnight in India um, and she's visiting family at the moment. So we thought it was a bit nasty to ask her to do this. But some of the things that Shalmali can do, she can arrange some boutique accommodation for you. And she can take you out to remote villages like Turtuk, which is a two day drive north of Ley to go and meet the craftsmen and the artisans there and really do whatever you want um, in the region. And there are loads of really nice tailor made options for those that want it. From a routing and from a group tour perspective, we have one final trip, which I'm just going to very quickly run you through, called the High Road to Kashmir, which takes you from Leh and takes you north into the Nubra Valley and then takes you um, westwards out to Srinagar. So if you're going to Nubra, you do go over the highest motorable pass in the world, the Kardung La, at 5,606 metres. Um, again, a spectacular journey, taking you right the way down to the Nubra Valley, which today is effectively a dead end, but in times gone past was part of a major trading route into China. And then going westwards from Leh, you actually follow the Indus River all the way um, down past monasteries like Lama Yuru, um, and you, we detour to Rangdom, which you can see on the bottom right, before eventually coming to the Zoji La, and finishing in the Kashmiri capital of Srinagar, where I have never been, um, but I do know that it is Johnny Bilby's um, favorite place in the whole of India. So Johnny, I will hand back to you. Uh, yes, thank you, Mark. Um, brilliant, well done. Uh, not really too quick at all. That was fantastic, uh, very well delivered. Um, yeah, Kashmir is a place close to my heart. I've been there many, many times and I will be hoping to go back there uh, in March or April when I get out to India. 
Um, I think the route that you've just described is absolutely epic. We've seen, you know, from the pictures you've just shown, it, it's it's quite amazing. And of course, a completely different culture as you get up there onto the Tibetan Plateau. What's fascinating about uh, the other trip that we run to the region, which is the high road to Kashmir, which goes from Leh over the uh, Zojila, which is another very high pass, on, on landscape similar to what's behind your head now. Um, and then you come down into the Vale of Kashmir, which of course is a Muslim world. And the famed beauty of Kashmir is, is um, well, absolutely extraordinary. If I can share my screen again, let me just see if I... I did, 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 uh, yeah, no, I haven't actually got that picture, but, um, oh, and I need to do the slideshow from the side. Um, but, but it's, yeah, it's one of those places that I go back to time and again, and the, uh, the houseboats, um, the walking there, the culture, of course, as everyone knows, it's had its problems. Um, and one of the reasons why I want to go back up there is to see just where we are at at the moment, as far as those kind of things are concerned. But my friends that live up there tell me that, um, you know, they're opening new hotels, new experiences. So, uh, I'm hopeful that we will get Kashmir uh, back uh, this summer, which would be great. Um, so just a few other things. Um, of course, as Mark just explained, we don't really think India is going to be seriously open for travel until the summer. And then obviously the autumn, it'll really kick off. I will get out there as quick as I can. And, um, you know, you'll be able to follow me uh, as I go around, no doubt, Instagramming and what have you, as soon as I can get there. We do have other destinations, of course. Um, the, the Silk Road is still very popular, Central Asia. Georgia and the Caucasus is incredibly popular. Great walking holidays in uh, across Europe uh, and the Middle East and, and a few other places besides. So we can do all of that. Um, do check out Wild Frontiers TV. We have a lot of videos um, there of these particular trips, uh, particularly some offbeat ones of India. You can organize a Zoom consultation with any of our uh, travel consultants, if you'd like to organize your own tailor-made trip um, to any of these places. Um, and we have the Wild Frontiers Foundation. Um, when we were doing these live, um, and Kate very kindly did a couple for us, uh, both at the Royal Geographical Society and indeed at the Frontline Club, and we would charge on the door and uh, the money from that would go towards our Wild Frontiers Foundation, which uh, supports communities, wildlife projects, conservation projects, etc. Uh, in the countries that we visit. Of course, when we're doing these on Zoom, we can't get that. Um, so, but very generously, uh, people do go online and make a donation. So if you felt like doing that, that would be most wonderful. Um, we're still working on reduced deposits, 20, 200 pounds for groups, $250, 20% uh, for tailor-made. And we still have our COVID promise in place, which basically says if the trip can't go because it's not COVID viable, then you will get a refund or free transfer. Um, and very briefly, our group tours um, are maximum group size 12. Um, I'm just going to, uh, no, I will leave that for a minute. Uh, all uh, tour leaders and local guides, interesting and affordable accommodation and transport, full board, so almost everything's included, COVID health and safety policy. And as I say, we have a full uh, team of travel specialists that will help you work out the kind of trip that Kate did and we are at all protected. So um, going to some questions. Uh, now normally we get loads of questions but I haven't actually got so many. Uh, Mark I've got one that I'll throw at you which is when is the best time of year to do um, to, to do these trips both Kate's and Rajasthan and, and, and that sort of uh, part of India? Generally Rajasthan um... October, I think the peak months are November and February, but October to March generally is the season. You can push some of them to April. And I know that we have run trips um, you know, during the monsoon time. You can usually get it at a, at a discount. And the monsoon doesn't mean you cannot travel to India. Um, and often it just, just means that for a couple of hours in the afternoon, um, it will rain. Um, but there is some you know, great accommodation with, um, with air conditioning. The crowds, especially from Western visitors to the plains, is definitely lower. So it's not a complete no-no, especially for people that only have summer holidays. But generally, October to March for the plains and then for the high Himalaya, um, you are looking at the summer. You can go for extreme purposes in the winter time, um, but most people would go, yeah, July to September is the best time. Great, Kate, one for you. It, it, it's, you know, maybe not entirely relevant to your trip, but it's a, a question from an anonymous attendee asking about traveling in India as a woman. Obviously there's been some negative press over the last few years. 
and uh, she'd like to know how whether you ever felt threatened or or you felt comfortable uh, in your travels. And I, I guess that doesn't just mean on our trip, it means whenever you've been in Generally, India. Generally, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, and I've, I've traveled, uh, as I say, uh, to lots of different regions uh, of India. Um, one uh, place that, um, I don't know whether you take trips, but do you, do you go to Magalia, Johnny? Johnny? Oh goodness, I'm gonna to have to ask, where is Magalia? So it's um, right up, it's sort of near Assam. So it's okay. right up in the north. It's sort of on the Bangladesh border. Yeah. And um, there is a, a, a tribal group there known as the uh, Kasi. And they, it's a, a matrilineal society. So for the person asking the question, that might be a, a really interesting part of India for them to go. It's really, it, I mean, it was a fascinating place. I made a film there about this particular group of people. Um, uh, it's a beautiful region. The um and now I've got to my Did slightly you know, work fogged brain. I've got to remember the the main um the name of the main city, which will come to me. It's very hilly, um, uh, beautiful walking. It's uh, the place that has those incredible bridges that have, have been. Oh yeah, the Magalaya Road bridges. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And um uh and but what's really interesting about being there is that as a woman on your own, I went running on my own uh, in the main city um uh women um it's it's not hindu so um again it has a very different feel about it and it definitely feels a uh, very kind of relaxed and an easy place to be a woman on your own mm. other places in in india um i mean i i draw attention i'm tall i've got blonde hair um you're going to get attention but i've never felt it to be threatening or uncomfortable um but that may be either because i've got a thick skin uh or that i'm a you know i've done a lot of traveling i'm used to people kind of thinking i'm odd um but i've certainly never ever felt uh threatened or scared in india great and of course one of the answers to the question. In fact, Alison asks um, it, 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 what would be the best trip for her as a solo traveller that is slightly nervous about India. And I would mm. say one of our group tours. I mean, they're, they're perfect for that. Um, just 12 people, um, the Taj Temples and Tigers as a first time a trip or inside Kerala and Karnataka are, are a great way to see it as a, as a solo traveller if you are yeah. you know, slightly nervous about travelling there on yeah. your own. Um, Mark, another one for you. Oh, I, I can actually answer this a bit. Uh, altitude sickness being a problem in the far north. Um, the, the, the route that Mark talks about, and I've done this route a couple of times, which takes you from the Rotang Pass, which is about 3000 meters. In fact, Kate, you, you would have bicycled somewhere up here, I suspect, when you went from Shimla probably to Manali mm. and, 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 mm. and on, on your original charity challenge. When you go north of there up to Leh, you do have to go over I think it's called the Badalachala and the Tanglangla, and they are about 4,800 meters and 5,000 meters. And you have to sleep uh, in between the two at about 4,000 meters. Now, by the time you get there, you're generally pretty acclimatized, but I did once have a situation where a, a lady got altitude sickness. It wasn't bad, she was fine. Um, we drove her out and, and it was no problem. And the brilliant thing about altitude sickness is as soon as you come down, you, you, you're cured. It goes away almost immediately. So that's the only place. Kashmir, no problems. The only one is is on that drive. Um, you know, if, if you're if you feel that you are uh, you might possibly get it, then Diamox is not a bad idea to take some of that to, to help you uh, on that way. Um, uh, bit, of a, bit of a last minute question. A few years ago, you advertised a trip to Spitty. Any plans to consider that in the future? Yes, goodness, I would love to. Um, we, we kind of consolidated a bit um, and there are a few trips that we would love to get back on and I think we will in the future. I think Spitty, have you been up Spitty, Kate? No, never. That, that, that's a kind of, you, you hang off to the, off the journey that Mark's just no. talked about. You, you hang a right about half right. way up and, and, and head off there. John Marley loves it. And I know yeah. if, if you're tailor-made, absolutely. She would literally fall over herself to try and arrange that from a group yeah. tour. Yeah, we'll just wait until basically the world picks up again and then we'll offer again. 
Uh, Kate, one for you here. Have you been back to the pepper plantation since you did the Spice Trail show? Oh no, I ha I haven't uh, sadly. But um, what a what a, uh, a an incredible um, experience that was. And again, I mean that's something something we should talk about. Maybe Johnny is 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 doing kind of a, a yeah doing yeah. a spice doing a spice uh, route in India and, and perhaps um, doing a two centre doing in India and Sri Lanka because we did some really, uh, there's, you, you know, again, some fascinating stories, the pepper plantation, the pepper story was, was actually rather a tragic one. Um, uh, cinnamon uh, that we did in Sri Lanka. Um, so there's, yeah, that's that's maybe. Um, thank you, whoever asked that question, um, for uh, for for yes, sparking a potential idea there. Um, it was it as I say, it was a, a really really interesting series to do, and I loved that uh, that particular bit of it. Um, one question, last question for you, Mark. Um, is there any opportunity for some trekking slash walking on the lay trip, or is it more driving and sightseeing? Um, there is in we spend two nights in Shimla, two nights in Dharamsala, and two nights in Manali. And that's usually one day to arrive there, and then usually a half a day to do some sightseeing, and then a half a day to go for a walk. So, yes, there is. I'm very aware that there's a big distance to cover. So, there's always opportunities to get out and walk. Once you're on the big drive, again, we stop, you take some little walks. It's not a trekking trip per se, but no, there are some definitely some opportunities to get out and stretch legs for sure. Uh, and, and I guess if you wanted to, and you like that idea of the journey, putting on an extension of a of, of, of well, whatever kind of trek you want up in Ley would be relatively definitely. Simple. And there's um, there's some really nice treks that you can do up there. Shakti, which is a very, yeah. very lovely product, which again, I know Shalmali adores. Um, they have some village houses to a very, very nice um, yeah, standard that, that you can walk Great. from village to house to village house. Um, so that's a really nice thing that you can do. There's the Ladakhi Women's Cooperative as well that we yeah. can work with. So no, there's various options for people that want to do um, some more serious walking up there. Great. Um, well, look, that's that's really it. Thank you so much for putting in your questions. Kate, can I just say once again, thank you so much for your support and help and your um, wonderful presentation there about the trip through Madhya Pradesh. Well, thank, thank you for thank you for the trip. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. Um, and uh, Mark, as always, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think that's it. So we'll just wrap up. And um, oh, by the way, the next presentation is on the 9th of February. It's going to be at one o'clock in the afternoon because Mark Stedman, who is talking about Laos, is coming to us live from Laos. And we don't want him to be doing that at midnight. So we're doing a presentation on Cambodia and Laos, and that will be on the 9th of February at one o'clock. So thanks again, Kate. Cheers, Mark. And thank you, all of you, for watching. Fantastic. Thank you. Good Bye. night. Bye.